Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Paul Day, and I'm gonna be doing a new topic in environmental sciences, evolution, extinction, and biodiversity. Uh, these are very sophisticated topics, by the way. Uh, you can do an entire course just on evolution, an entire course on extinction, an entire course on biodiversity, but we're going to be nibbling a little bit at, uh, at this topic because it's so important for understanding the fabric of life that is all around us. And that fabric of life, of course, is important for understanding the consequences for decisions that are being made. And it's also important for understanding the past when we're looking especially at the fossil record. What might have happened to bring about the conditions that exist today? So let's go ahead and jump into this fascinating world of evolution, extinction, and biodiversity. I know you're really going to enjoy it. All right, we're going to go ahead and we're going to begin by learning a couple of very important terms. They're thrown about quite a bit in uh, common textbooks. They're thrown about on television. They're thrown about on the internet. Uh, a lot of people use these words, but they don't really know what they mean. So we want to dig into what we mean in terms of environmental science. The first word here is going to be species. Species is a population, and we're going to come to this word population here in a minute. You can see it down here or group of populations whose members share characteristics. Um, so what do we mean by that? Well, ultimately we mean by characteristics that result in animals that can breed with one another and produce fertile offspring. That's a species. So just because an animal has four legs, walks around and eats grass, does not necessarily mean it's the same species as other animals that have four legs and eat grass. Let me give you an example of say a wildebeest and a, and a horse right? They are not members of the same species. Uh, they cannot breed with one another and produce fertile offspring. Uh, horses can find other horses. Wildebeests can find other wildebeests. Uh, in the case of horses, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but wait a minute, can't a horse breed with a donkey? Aren't those therefore of the same species? Well, ask yourself, what is the offspring of a horse and a donkey? Right? It's a mule. So it's neither a horse nor a donkey, it's a hybrid of the two. And can a mule reproduce? The answer is it cannot. So these two uh, species, in this case the horse and the uh, donkey, are separate species that do have enough in common with one another genetically where they're able to produce offspring, but those offspring are not viable. In other words, they cannot produce their own offspring. Okay, so there's not going to be a wild horde uh, herd, I'm sorry, of mules running around out in the wilderness. A population is simply a group of individuals of a species that live in the same area. In other words, this is a group that has the ability to interact with one another, to, uh, to survive together. They might even have a common food source, and they're certainly reproducing with one another. Okay, I want to give you an example of two animals who have very similar characteristics, but do not interbreed with one another and have produced uh, fertile offspring. We brought up the case of the horse and the mule. But here we have this right here, right? Two birds, the warbler and the chiff chaff, if I'm saying that even correctly. Uh, the chiff chaff is this one over here. Here's the warbler over here. They're very similar. They're almost identical in appearance, but they do not interbreed. They do not interbreed at all. All right, so now that we have defined what a species is and we've defined what populations are, let's go ahead and dive right into a very important topic, kind of the focus of most of this lecture, everything else is derived from it, is evolution. Evolution is just simply change over time in biological systems. Uh, biological evolution is simply change in populations of organisms over generations. It's just the net change in the populations itself, right? It might be in an individual here or a trait that we're seeing here and there, but overall we're seeing biological evolution, which is the overall change. Genetic changes lead to changes in appearance. Now remember, when we're talking about genetic, we're talking about the genes, right? The DNA that make us up. Those changes, that evolution, lead to changes in appearance, functioning, right? So we don't look the same over time. We don't function the same way over time or we might not have the same behaviors as a consequence. Now, genetic changes in evolution may be random. They could occur due to a mutation, for example. However, some things are favorable 
In other words, it might be really good to have, I don't know, x-ray vision or something if you're a human being. So suddenly you can see through walls and detect threats and maybe be a, a great hunter. Um, so we, as far as I can tell, people have not evolved this yet, but it might be something that's favorable. Or it might turn out that x-ray vision takes up so much energy that you have a very short lifespan and it makes life very difficult, right? Who knows how that would work out? Life is full of trade-offs, it turns out. So that means that it might be directed by natural selection. Now, what is natural selection? Natural selection is simply the process in which traits that enhance survival and reproduction, so both of these things, um, are passed on more frequently to future generations than those that do not. So if you have a better chance to survive in an environment, um, then over time, your offspring are going to pick up on that survivability and they're going to have more offspring, right? And so it becomes a self-fulfilling process where the reproduction is feeding the survivability, which is then feeding the reproduction back and forth, okay? And there's a great example of this here. I have a YouTube uh, example that I would like to direct you to. If you've got the chance, I'll put it down in the comments section so you can go ahead, or I'm sorry, in the description, so that you can go ahead and follow up on it. It's a great little video showing how natural selection can work in the uh, proliferation, uh, say, of diseases and how uh, antibiotics are uh, uh, can over time be overcome through natural selection of pathogens that are trying to make you sick. Uh, genetic makeup of future populations is therefore changed over time through natural selection, right? So here we have a male peacock and a female peacock. The female peacock does not have the plumage that we're seeing coming off this male peacock. This male peacock, of course, has acquired this plumage through years and years, in fact, generations upon generations of natural selection. So what is making the selection? Well, we believe that the female is attracted to that plumage. And so that enhances his ability to reproduce. Does it mean that it's easy? Uh, I'm sure maintaining this and feeding that feather, those feathers to be able to make that plumage uh, is a bit of a challenge. It's a little bit of extra energy, but that energy is put to good use because it enhances their ability to reproduce because it's being selected for by the female. Okay. And that plays a big role. If one of these uh, sexes inside of the, uh, you know, in the, in the peacock species is selecting for large plumage, you're going to see large plumage over time. If they dislike it, you'll see less of it. Now, I cannot emphasize enough as we're going through this, that evolution is one of the best supported and most illuminating concepts in all of science. In fact, it is the foundation of modern biology. And of course, modern biology is the foundation of modern medicine. So it's extremely important to understand evolution and how it works. Now we must understand it to appreciate what environmental science has to offer us. So understanding how species change over time and adapt to their surroundings is crucial for comprehending ecology. We're gonna get into what ecology is here in a little bit. And the history of life, where do we come from? It's an important question, right? Because it's the question of us, where did we come from? Human beings. When I show a, a, a graphic like this here, we see that there's a gibbon and a human and a chimpanzee and a gorilla and a orangutan. And people will immediately say, are you trying to tell me that I evolved from a chimpanzee or an orangutan? No, that's not what evolution is telling us. What it's telling us is that we might have some type of common ancestor that has many of the same traits, right? The ability to stand upright with the long appendages that are used for holding and grabbing things. We're walking on feet, right? We can see that many of these features that we're seeing between especially a, a human and a chimpanzee are very similar, but also a little bit different, right? A little bit different, right? The way that a chimpanzee walks is not the same way that a human being walks. The way that they socialize is not the same, but there's still some familiarity between the two, right? So evolutionary processes influence pesticide resistance, agriculture, 
medicine, health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, it is our understanding of evolution that has led to the breakthroughs of many of the things that we enjoy today in our modern sciences, in our food supply, and of course, the lecture series that I'm presenting right now will cover many of those evolutionary processes and those breakthroughs uh, that human beings have accomplished as a consequence of our understanding of it. Now, our understanding of natural selection and how it shapes organisms and diversity wasn't really worked out for a very long time in human history. We, it's actually a fairly new concept in terms of science. Uh, it really came about uh, on the shoulders of a person by the name of Charles Darwin, uh, who is pictured right over here off to the right. He's a very famous person. Um, he wrote uh, some very important treatises um, on the origin of species, which is the regard, which is considered one of the most important texts in all of biology. Um, that book uh, lays out the principles of natural selection, including the evidence, um, which is pretty convincing stuff. And in 1858, he came out with it. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace had independently come up with the idea also. Um, and they realized that uh, Darwin and Russell came to get to know each other. They were familiar. They became familiar with each other's works. And they decided to go ahead and release this new concept, this natural selection, that later uh, fed into the concept of how evolution operates um, in 1858. So premises of natural selection were these, that organisms struggle to survive and reproduce. Uh, so life is hard, right? It takes a lot of effort. It takes some self-defense. takes some camouflage. Um, it takes a, a, a large uh, social network in certain situations, right? But that life was difficult and there was a large amount of struggle that organisms produce more offspring than can survive. So in other words, they're constantly trying to improve the, uh, in terms of the species, the number of offspring that they have, right? So if you, if, if your species constantly producing three offspring, but five die for every three you produce, you're going to decline pretty quickly. So you need to have an upward tra trajectory on your population. Now that doesn't mean that your population is gonna grow infinitely, Right, you can continue to produce, but there is going to be effects that, that kick in at some point. Something called the carrying capacity will set in. All right, so individuals of a species vary in their characteristics due to genes and the environment. Individuals, right? So it's not just the species themselves that are carrying all the genes, but the individuals within the, the uh, species are almost like little laboratories of little things that are happening. For example, the traits that I have have probably never been seen by any other human being before. It doesn't mean that there aren't people that don't look similar to me or there aren't people that have many of the similar traits that I have, but my genetic makeup is unique to me. Okay. Now, of course, uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace had no idea about the way that uh, genes worked and all of this other stuff. They just knew that these traits were there. Okay, that some individuals are better suited to their environment and reproduce more effectively. And this feeds into what we were talking about with the peacock example previously, right? Now, organisms with better adapted traits will produce more offspring over time. And so, as a consequence, if you're able to produce more offspring, you can, we'll get into this idea of competition, but you're able to outcompete other people in an environment or other species within an environment or other individuals with an environment, and your traits are more likely to be passed on until something else gains some type of advantage over you, in which case your uh, traits will take a nosedive and theirs will, take it, will be uh, preferred in that situation. Now that we've discussed what natural selection is, we have to talk about the process where over time, these traits wind up manifesting themselves in organisms uh, and the creation of species. The main way that this occurs is what through a process we call adaptation. Uh, this is where, as I just defined, the process where over time, characteristics, what we call traits, right? Those are those characteristics. I use the word traits. Uh, on the last little segment there, but it's the term characteristics is a really good uh, uh, descriptor for that, that lead to better reproductive success and becomes more prevalent in the population. That's adaptation. So you start to see more and more and more of it as it's adapted into the population there. 
An adaptive trait is a trait that promotes reproductive success. Something that's actually functioning and working. It's the actual trait that is working. Um, now we need to say, what is it that might be triggering these adaptive traits? What might be creating this, these changes that are happening? Um, one of the ways that is most commonly cited is mutations. Mutations are accidental changes in DNA that may be passed on to the next generation. So remember, your DNA is a code, and a mutation is just a change in that code. That's all it is. Now, non-lethal mutations provide the genetic variation on which natural selection acts. Now, what if there is a lethal mutation? Well, it means you don't survive, right? You die from it. Maybe it causes a heart defect. Perhaps it causes some type of, of cancer. Or for whatever reason, it's lethal. It terminates the organism if they happen to have this mutation. But a non-lethal mutation could be an opportunity to alter the toolkit that some organism has. And it might make things like, I don't know, five fingers versus six fingers. Blue eyes versus, say, uh, green eyes. Uh, whatever the change is right, that is being changed or tinkered with is the consequence of a mutation that is happening within the genetic code. Sexual reproduction also leads to variation, right? Everybody's bringing something to the table, right? We're all individuals with our own kind of biological laboratory. And what we're doing is we're combining our biological laboratory with the biological laboratory of another individual with the population. So if a human male and a human female are uh, reproducing, they're bringing their own traits to the table and the offspring are going to have some of one trait and some of another. Uh, some tra I'm sorry, some traits of one parent and some traits of the other, right? That's what sexual reproduction does. This is as opposed to asexual reproduction, which is where the offspring look just like the parents. And there's uh, all kinds of issues that can arise from that over time. But sexual reproduction allows for these laboratories to constantly experiment and to alter things. So your offspring may look like you, but they're not identical to you. And they will have little changes that have never been seen before uh, within the species. Now, this can lead to some really interesting consequences, a concept called directional selection. This is what drives a feature in one direction. So if you go out into the desert, for example, the, the, the desert of the southwestern United States, you'll find very tall cacti. The, the cacti populations out there are a consequence of directional selection. You do not find oak trees, for example, in the middle of a sand dune. Uh, and the reason why is because of the conditions that are favoring one type, what we call a phenotype, over another. So a phenotype is a body form or a, or a type of, of or set of adaptations that are being manifested by that organism. And so what we could do is we could look at these charts here to give you an idea of how directional, um, how directional uh, changes can happen over time, what we call genetic selection. We have a y-axis and an x-axis. And what we're seeing here is the red is the original distribution of the population here with all the different types. Um, and if there is a uniform directional push in one direction over time, this red will morph into what we're seeing here with the blue. Okay, this is when we're seeing it pushed into an extreme direction. So, for example, if an area, if you have uh, birds that are, say, red and another type of bird with that is within the species that is white and the area undergoes some type of climate change. All of a sudden the area is covered in snow. The red birds become much less preferred in that environment than the white ones because the white ones can hide obviously in the trees or in the snow, okay? Uh, more effectively than the red ones can. So what will you see over time? A drift towards the white colored birds living within that snow environment. Now, if it was a snowy environment and it went the opposite direction, then perhaps the red ones would be preferred over time, right? So you get the concept. Um, so this is where you're, you're taking something and pushing it into an extreme direction. Now, uh, what we're seeing here on graph number two is that same population over time is suddenly uh, being normalized where we're having a single 
the kind of the central parts uh, of the uh, the group, the average part of the group, being emphasized, where the extreme examples are being cut out. They're not being preferred. Okay, so we're reinforcing everything towards a single, uh, what we call phenotype again. Or we could have a disruptive one where the, the, the single phenotype is not preferred. Maybe a disease is hit and it's able to wipe out the center part of this. But for some reason, the extremes are able to survive, right? And be able to reproduce and carry that on into the future populations. And so what we'll see in this case, disruptive speciation, one species separating off from the other. It's, it's really interesting to see all the different possibilities. Now, probably the best way to really understand what is going on when we're talking about this is not to sh simply show you the graphs, even though it gives you the idea, is to actually show you real examples that we believe have happened, um, where we look at related species in different environments, right? So you're taking a species that is in one environment and has been subjected to a completely different environment to see if there's any changes that have occurred over time. And this would create different pressures and would, in theory, cause the creation of different traits. This would be more evolution that would happen, right? And so one of the best places to look at is Charles Darwin's own work. He was actually looking at finches uh, in the Galapagos Islands, uh, as well as animals across South America. But the, the finches are just famous. Um, what we're looking at is four of Darwin's finches, um, the species that he was looking at here. And we'll notice that they are all started off as just regular finches. They were all identical. They are from a common ancestor, but they were on an island where there were no competitors or these big open areas. Uh, and so the finches spread out into different areas. Some went into the trees, some went down into the grass, uh, and they began adapting and hunting for different things. Some became uh, uh, animals that hunted for nuts, and other ones looked for insects, other ones became more vegetarian, looking for seeds, and other ones were looking for and picking for uh, other little insects and worms. And so as a consequence, over time, they had selective traits and pressures that were put on them, and they underwent something called divergent evolution. So divergent evolution is the accumulation of differences between closely related populations within a species leading to speciation. In other words, the formation of new species. So here we are seeing these finches. Notice that their bills, right, are all designed for different things. They eat differently. They run in different populations. They live in a different portion of the Galapagos Islands and, are, uh, and fulfilling different roles. And we'll get into what those roles are in another lecture. But here we're seeing four different species of finches that originated as a single species. Conversely, if you take animals from that are unrelated to one another, but you put them into similar environments, they might even take on very similar body forms to the point where you might make the assumption that they're very closely related when in fact they have very different ancestries. A great example of this would be the modern dolphin, right? Here we're seeing the skeleton of a modern dolphin. And below here is an extinct species of something called an ichthyosaur. So when we're looking at these, we might say these things are very closely related. They're clearly marine animals. Uh, the difference is, is that the modern dolphin is a mammal. Um, it originated on land, but it's a mammal. It has completely different ancestry than this ichthyosaur whose ancestors were also land animals. But in this case, it was a reptile. So here we're seeing something that looks like a fish, but it's in fact a reptile. Here we're seeing something that has features that shows that it's, meta, uh, that it's marine. Um, we could even say fish-like also. But again, this is a mammal, this is a land animal. And the relationship between these two, there is none. There is none. But we see that convergent evolution of them going into the same environment and therefore adapting similar traits. So now that we've covered the basics of what evolution is and how it changes animal forms and life forms over time, one of the things it also is very good at doing is generating something called biodiversity. So biodiversity 
Uh, we got a nice little definition up here. It's also biological diversity, right? It's a two words put together. Um, it's the variety of life across all levels of biological organization. This is the species, right? Not just uh, all turtles, but down to the specific turtles over time, as we're seeing a sea turtle swimming through the ocean right here in a marine environment in a, near a coral reef. But it also affects the genes. So it might be affecting areas that are not visible to us. Uh, it could be affecting populations and communities. And so as a consequence, we're producing new animal forms all the time with all these different traits, with different genes. Those genes are moving into different portions of the ecosystem globally. Scientists have described about 1.8 million species, but estimates of the total number of species that exist range from 3 million to 100 million. And biodiversity exists nearly everywhere. And one of the most biodiverse locations where you can see it plain as day is a coral reef. This is unlike a rainforest, which is one of the most bio, which is the most biodiverse area. Uh, coral reefs, you can look through the water and you can see every little thing that's going on out here as long as you have uh, good vision through the water, as long as it's not too murky. Uh, whereas if you're in a forest, a lot of this stuff can be hidden. You can clearly see the complex interactions between all of these animals, all of which depend upon each other to some extent. And it's biodiversity created through evolution that makes this scene that you're looking at in this picture happen. Now, the question fundamentally is going to be, if evolution is constantly taking old forms and making new forms, there's got to be a point where a new form, a new species comes into existence. And we call that speciation. Speciation produces new types of organisms. Uh, it's the process of generating new species from a single species, right? You're going to create one species, and that species have the, has the opportunity to branch out and to have descendants that could be of different types in different locations. I want to give a great example of speciation allopatric speciation. So species formation due to physical separation of populations, where you're physically moving animals or separating them due to some kind of barrier. This is considered the main mode. It's not the only mode, but it's the main mode for speciation. Why would you need to create another body form? Well, a great place to look at this is going to be right here in Central Africa. We're going to come back to this map here in a minute. But the populations can be separated by glaciers, right? So a glacier is a moving object, has the ability to come into a valley and separate herds of animals away from each other, perhaps run over certain areas, freeze rivers, things like this. Uh, rivers coming into existence can separate one group of animals from another. And of course, mountains rising. Imagine an entire mountain chain rising in the middle of a continent or near the edge of a continent and separating one group off from another. And in fact, we see this frequently when we look at mountain chains. The animals are rapidly having to evolve in response to the uplift of those mountains. Think of the Himalaya and its very rapid growth around Mount Everest. You know that the animals are having to adapt to those constantly changing uh, situations or they have to leave. Okay, So each uh, population gets its own set of mutations in the manner that we just described over the last couple of slides. And of course, natural selection can speed the process. This uh, situation that we're looking up over here is the range of different animals uh, that are related to the um, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos. These are primates, right? So the red shade uh, shows the dominion of the bonobo over here. The blue shading is the common chimpanzee over here. And notice that where the bonobo is and where the chimpanzee here is very little. In fact, on this map, there's no overlap between the two of them. Uh, this is a classic example of allopatric speciation because there's a separate there's a separating barrier between the two of these. In this fact, it's one of the largest rivers in the world, the Congo River, and so these two uh, populations are completely separated from one another, and they have no habitat in common. Okay, and there are other species uh, that show these separations also, right here. But this one here is clear as day. You can clearly see that here we have the chimpanzee. And here we have the bonobo right in this location with the Congo River separating the two. Classic allopatric speciation. Now by looking at all of the different animals and all the different plants and all of the different uh, 
organisms, bacteria and whatever, that we're finding on planet Earth, we can compare them. We start to realize that certain patterns start to emerge by comparing them one to another. One thing that we can do very easily, for example, is we can compare a human being to a chimpanzee. And we recognize very rapidly, well, we're not chimpanzees, but we're certainly much more similar to a chimpanzee than we are to, say, uh, a piece of algae that's floating in the water. Right. We have we have hands. We have the ability to walk. You know, we carry out certain reproductive abilities that algae does completely differently. But we do have some things in common with algae. We have certain traits that we have in common with algae. And so an algae, of course, is very similar to other things that are very algae like. Uh, so we have groups that we can compare things to. And one of the things that begins to arise is, is that we see these relationships and when they start to show up in Earth's history. One of the great things about our ability to do this, map all of this out, is it allows us to produce something called a phylogenetic tree. The phylogenetic tree is simply a diagram that shows the relationships among species, groups, and genes, etc., that happen on planet Earth. So, species, uh, I'm sorry, scientists can trace how certain traits evolved. Some traits evolved and were passed on, right? So, we know that they came about, they were passed on to descendants, and that other traits evolved more than once. For example, the ability to fly, swimming dinosaurs. Uh, dinosaurs are, are really interesting, right? These are reptiles. Reptiles uh, evolved on land, but their ancestors were amphibians, which evolved in the water. So we have these animals that came out of the water, lost the ability to live in the water permanently, and then we see reptiles then re-entering the water. Um, and forming these ichthyosaurs, which were huge animals, by the way. Okay, just absolutely fascinating animals. Uh, so we have losing the ability to swim, and now they could swim again, right? Fascinating. Um, the ability to fly. Certain, we actually recognize that certain species and, and uh, ancestors of birds gain the ability to fly, lose it, gain it, lose it, gain it, lose it. And it's just kind of the way that evolution works because sometimes it works to be a flyer and sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on where you live. Look at a penguin. You might be thinking to yourself, if I'm a bird, I don't ever want to lose my ability to fly. Penguins learn the ability to swim and they're fantastic swimmers. So it just depends on your environment. So let's look at this phylogenetic tree to show you a little bit about how it works. Now, what we notice right away is it all stems from a common ancestor, something that exists. What does that common ancestor have? Well, it has DNA, it has DNA. And then once we, if, if that's all we have, if we just have kind of a blob of DNA within a cell structure, that's a bacteria, okay? But if we have other features within the cell, for example, mitochondria, which helps carry out uh, metabolic processes within the, uh, within the cell, uh, nuclei, uh, whether or not the animal has organs, you know, maybe a stomach, a heart, liver, right? Unlike, uh, Unlike a, an iguana, for example, uh, conifers don't have organs. What do conifers have? Well, conifers, they have seeds. They carry out photosynthesis. This is a chloroplast, which allows the, uh, the organism to carry out photosynthesis, which is to say to take sunlight and use it to produce sugar, right? Um, and the same thing is happening all along here. We see, in this case, organs are developed, nerves and vascular systems. Well, jellyfish, they have organs, but they don't have nerves and vascular systems, and so on and so forth. It just keeps going on. And we re start to recognize that certain animals are very closely related, even if they don't appear to be related. For example, crocodiles are very closely related with birds, okay? Um, I, if you had asked me prior to, you know, if I was just kind of a zoo observer walking around, I would never think that a crocodile was more closely related to a bird than it was to say, a deer or something else, right? But they are. And the reason why is they live in different environments, they walk differently, but they, they clearly have a recent common ancestor, a recent to them common ancestor, okay? Um, and in fact, the same thing is happening over here. Marsupials, these are animals with pouches, like the kangaroo, um, is actually much more closely related to us than it is to, say, um, an iguana or a lizard, or, a, you know, lizards and snakes, of course, are clearly closely related. But a snake is actually more closely related to a bird than it is probably to a marsupial, right? Now, you may be of the impression that all we do is we look at modern animals, we can infer all of this history. But the reality is, is that we actually have a 
good understanding of what animals in the past look like, even the ones that are no longer with us. We've called those extinct animals, and we'll get into those here in a moment. What is that record? Well, it comes from fossils. So a fossil is an imprint in stone of a dead organism. For example, here we see a 558 million year old fossil. This is an animal that does not have um, uh, skeletons uh, or skeletal material. It doesn't have teeth, it doesn't have claws or anything like this. It's a soft bodied, uh, you know, as it's described here in the, in the caption, a mysterious jellyfish like rib creature. Um, and it existed prior to the existence of shells and all of these other things. Yet here we see it. It clearly has what we call bilateral symmetry, just kind of like what we have, right? One half mirrors the other half, right? And so here we see that bilateral symmetry uh, right there in the mud, okay? Um, and this type of record where we're looking at these old animals, and as we're looking at the oldest animals, they're very simple, like these things, like this jellyfish-like creature, okay? As we get to more recent times, even as recently as, say, 400 million years ago, they get a lot more complicated. And then when they get to 200 million years ago, we start to see vast changes in the fossil record again, and, and right up until modern times. And we're recognizing the animals are constantly changing. They're constantly altering themselves. And we call that evolution. And so we have that record, what we call the fossil record, which is the cumulative body of fossils worldwide. Now the fossil record shows that life has existed on planet Earth for at least 3.5 billion years. And the reason why we know it's only 3.5 billion, it could be even older, is because it's really hard to find rocks with fossils in them prior to that. The Earth, um, if you remember from our previous lecture, uh, lecture number three in the series, uh, the Earth is constantly recycling its crust. And as a consequence, it's always erasing its surface. And when it's erasing and it's destroying old rocks through the rock cycle and putting them into new forms and putting it to new use, um, the fossil record is also being destroyed. So it's really hard to get rocks that far back. Yet, we do have definitive evidence, actual fossils of animals from three and a half billion years old or older. Okay? And what we recognize is the simple process, right? The one we've been describing, that earlier types of organisms evolved into later ones. And that the number of species has increased over time. We see this in the rock record. This is actually, in fact, what we observe. We also recognize that most species have gone extinct on Earth. We see these really exotic things, whether it be a T-Rex or something like a trilobite, which is a simple sea creature that lived on the seafloor for hundreds of millions of years and then just went extinct. Okay? Yet, they were an important part of Earth's ecosystem and a big part of our own ancestry and what gave us who we are as a, as a not just a species as, of human beings, but the entire palette of what the Earth looks like right now um, is really as a, uh, due to their existence and what they were doing. Now, most species have gone extinct, and there have been several mass extinctions in the past. So sometimes they go extinct slowly. There's always kind of a background extinction going on. We'll talk about that here in a minute. However, these mass extinctions, which is where animals suddenly die in mass, have happened several times in the past and have taken out uh, large uh, swaths, not just of numbers of animals, but entirely wiped the entire species out so that the, so that the uh, biodiversity of that system had to be reset and evolution had to refill those holes, whether it be the grasses out in the prairie or the animals living in the ocean. All right, so now that we've talked about evolution, we've talked about the fossil record and the origin of species themselves, what we call speciation, um, and we've introduce the concept of extinction. We need to talk about what extinction is. So extinction is simply the disappearance of a species from Earth. And we've discovered that the average species will last on Earth between one to 10 million years on average. And this is the, the fossil record that's really giving us this information. Now this is important because it turns out that speciation and extinction together are what determine biodiversity, right? So your speciation is the creation of new species, whereas extinction is the destruction of new species, or a, a new, new destruction of species, I should say. So over time, species are going extinct. Extinction has historically been a natural occurrence. It's happening all the time. It would happen every single day, whether people were here or not. 
uh, to observe it. It's just been going on since the beginning of the origins of life on Earth. The loss of a species is irreversible. We can't bring it back. And uh, there's a, a very sad story here um, that I want to show in this picture here. This is the last northern white rhino. We have that here in the caption. He died on 3-20-2018. So in, uh, that'd be March 20th, 2018. Uh, that was four months after this photograph was was taken from this source that we have right here. I retrieved it in November of 2017. And I've kept it for a very long time because it's very sentimental to me. This is the very last northern white rhino. There were a few females that were remaining, but this was the last of the, of the males. And as we talked about, without the males, you know, the species tends to go pretty quickly because there's nothing to reproduce with at that point. Uh, there's some uh, interesting history about what's going on here, what they're trying to do uh, to be able to make sure that that ecosystem is taken care of by what the, the rhinos used to do for it. Um, but anybody who's interested in that uh, can definitely delve into uh, an internet search and again, go down that rabbit hole and see what was going on there. So let's talk about what causes extinction. What might be the effects of extinction on, say, biodiversity? So human activity profoundly affects rates of extinction on Earth. We've discovered this all over the place, that biodiversity loss affects people directly. It affects our food, but it has affected our fibers, you know, in the form of forest and deforestation. Medicines are undoubtedly have been lost. Many of the medicines that we need for just for everyday use for some people uh, are natural in the environment. They're enhanced and they're sold through the pharmaceutical business, but we discover them because nature already has it for us. And of course, ecosystem services, which we've talked about in previous lectures, but this is the services, the clean air, the cleaning of the air, the cleaning of the water, that the and, and the uh, rejuvenation of oxygen in the atmosphere, all of these things, the protection of your head from ultraviolet radiation, is all provided for free by, by the earth, right? So it does seem to have some effect on certain aspects of these things. Uh, extinction can occur when the environment changes rapidly and natural selection cannot keep up. So if natural selection cannot keep up and continuously fill the gap, extinction will eventually take over and it will cause damage to the ecosystem and cause, and, and, and cause permanent harm. Many factors cause extinction, severe weather, uh, climate change. This is a climate change image that we're having up over here. This is a, obviously a polar bear that's uh, emaciated. It's starving to death. Um, this is a place where the polar bear uh, historically has been able to live, but there has been a retreat of the ice sheet in the north. And as a consequence, we have this bear that is white, which does really well when it's uh, got snow and there's sea ice all around, but it doesn't do so well when there's no sea ice. There's nothing to eat. Every uh, its prey can see it coming from miles and miles away, and it gets out of the way. So this this uh, polar bear is definitely struggling at this location. Uh, so climate change can do this. Changing sea levels can do this, of course. Uh, the arrival of a new species. Perhaps there's you know a better predator that's in the area that's more effective at getting the food supply uh, or getting that food source than you are, and so it's able to outcompete you, remove that food supply, and you starve to death. So uh, arrival of a new species, and of course being a small population or a specialized species, you can only live in a certain area because you only do a certain thing. Uh, so panda, panda bears do uh, effectively this. Now, of course, there are specialized species all over the world, and some of these species are extremely vulnerable to extinction. And in particular, I want to focus on endemic species. An endemic species are a species that only exists in a certain specialized area. So you, it can only live here, you can't take it somewhere else and have it effectively reproduce and thrive and be prosperous. Uh, and as a consequence, this makes it very susceptible to extinction. Um, they usually have fairly small populations, and this is really common on island species, which are often endemic and thus at risk. So if you take a, uh, a certain bird, for example, the one that we have right here is the sunbird, which lives in South Africa. It lives in a very narrow range. Uh, I believe they call it the Finbos range. Um, 
where it can only live in certain areas, it performs certain functions, and then once you get out of that area, if you try to take the sunbird somewhere else, it can't survive, it doesn't do well at all. So this is an, un, an orange crested, uh, I'm sorry, orange breasted sunbird um, from South Africa, and it's endemic to that region. It can't be moved anywhere else. So let's look at what we now know about extinction on planet Earth over time. First off, there's the background extinction rate. It's what's happening all the time, uh, every single day. It's the constant slow rate of extinction that occurs as a part of evolution. It's, it's a part of life. It's, it's something that nature needs and uses. It's a way of kind of gardening, or, or when you're doing gardening, you remove the weeds and you are constantly revitalizing the garden by removing those weeds and making room for new growth. That's what extinction technically is doing in the garden of evolution. Right? It's weeding out species that no longer have a proper role that are ineffective or inefficient or might have some problem that has been corrected by another species. However, there are also mass extinction events that have happened throughout Earth's history. And these are episodes that have killed off massive numbers of species all at once in a very short period of time. It could be in a short period of time in the sense that it, the Earth was hit by an asteroid or something like this. Or perhaps there was a climate event, or there was uh, maybe a disease or something that spread, or maybe a combination of these things, so that the extinction event lasted over maybe a million years. But what we do know is, is that we do have these events, and some of them we know a lot about, and some of them we don't know a lot about. Uh, what we can see by looking at the fossil record is we have five very clear times in Earth's history where 50 to 95% of all species go extinct at one time. The biggest event, um, I have these actually out of order over here, down here. The biggest event was 250 million years ago. Uh, this is the end of the Permian. And so 250 million years ago, let's look at this timeline over here. These are the extinction occurrence. These are the percentages. 250 million years ago, we could see, wow, look at the number of species that we've lost, right? So this is the extinction occurrence percentage. Um, in terms of the species themselves that went extinct, 75 to 95 percent of all species went extinct. This was a giant reset on the evolutionary button. There were huge holes in the ecosystem that had to be filled. And so a lot of things began to change. And in fact, it's from the end of the Permian into the end of the Cretaceous, which we're going to talk about here in a moment, that we have another extinction. This is the famous KT extinction. This is the period of time called the Mesozoic, and the Mesozoic is famously known as the time of the dinosaurs. So if it wasn't for the Permian extinction, which created this huge hole in the ecosystem, in the biodiversity, I should say, and, and gave rise through the, through the ecosystem for these different land animals and sea animals to, to, to proliferate, um, that gave rise to the, uh, to the reptiles, and the reptiles became the dinosaurs. And then, of course, 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs went extinct right here. And if it wasn't for their extinction, it's very possible that mammals, we are now living in a period of time called the age of mammals, it's the Cenozoic, um, from 65 million years ago to today, you, we notice that there's little, little blurbs of extinctions in here. But for the most part, it's been pretty smooth sailing compared to what's happened in the past. And we can recognize that here's another extinction, here's another extinction, here's one, here's one, here's one. So that's five that we have. Um, and so we are the benefactors of our, probably our greatest competitor, the dinosaurs having gone extinct. Is it possible that human beings wouldn't exist had that not happened? It's a great question to ponder. Now, we did bring up the idea earlier that human beings um, do have the ability to affect and change things around them. And it does appear that humans uh, might be causing the sixth mass extinct, ex extinction event. So we've talked about the five. Uh, what are the types of things that we're doing? Well, resource depletion, population growth, um, development of homes and buildings, uh, destruction of natural habitats hunting and harvesting of species, uh, introduction of non-native species. We take plants and animals from one place and we put them in another place. 
For example, we are taking uh, snakes from Indonesia, the python, and we're putting them in Florida where they don't live, but they're able to outcompete the, al uh, the alligator species and the snake species that are already there. As a consequence, today's extinction re rate is 100 to 1,000 times higher than the background rate and rising. Um, and we believe that it's going to take millions of years for biodiversity to recover. Uh, what are the types of things that we might be hunting and harvesting species for? Well, in this case, these are, it's illegal to do this, but these are elephant tusks. So how many elephants is this represented by? Well, I'm not going to count up all the tusks, but we know that elephants have two tusks per elephant, and we clearly see that these two here seem to match, even have the same coloration. That's probably one elephant. Here's another one. Here's another one, and so forth. We're looking at a large number of unfortunately dead uh, elephants, probably due to poaching. Uh, in fact, it says here in the caption, the tusks are from an $8 million shipment intercepted in Singapore. So this is, uh, this is a major problem. We have a similar thing going on with sharks, specifically with shark fin soup. Um, the number of, of sharks that are getting uh, captured and having their, their fins removed just for the purposes of making this delicacy. It's a very expensive delicacy, but that also drives the demand for the shark fin itself because it's so valuable. So with that, let's go ahead and conclude what I think was a very interesting conversation about evolution, biodiversity, and extinction, and the way that they're interrelated to one another. We're going to be doing more lectures that expand upon this um, and develop the entire fabric that is the ecosystem all around us, the environment that is all around us and how it works and how it functions on planet Earth. If you're interested, I look forward to seeing you uh, in those uh, videos when those are posted. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please put them down in the comment section. I look forward to seeing what you have to say. With that said, I'll see you next time. Take care.